with a uh, thousand tanker trucks trips required for every well, this will fill our, our rural back roads with fleets of 18 wheelers haul, hauling hazmat and putting diesel exhaust into the air. Um, all the compressors and the condensers also run on diesel. Um, so almost certainly will be blanketed with smog. Um, and of course, smog is also lethal. Uh, it contributes to preterm birth, uh, asthma, a heart attack risk, uh, stroke, diabetes, and so forth, and will add to our health care costs. So that was the focus of my um, testimony to the Albany last week and also the focus of my remarks in the congressional briefing on fracking uh, last month, because those are actually certainties. It's, they're not, that's absent accidents and catastrophes. Uh, I don't have any good data to share from you. Um, I'm planning to get some on our air quality already based on what's happening in Pennsylvania now. We know from um, what's happened in um, Texas and Arkansas that the air pollution created in the gas patch travels 200 miles from where the drill head heads are. So already our air is almost certainly being impacted by what's going on in Pennsylvania because we're downwind of Pennsylvania. Um, air travels along the uh, ridge of the uh, Appalachian Mountains, so we're on the tailpipe end of everything bad coming all the way from the Ohio Valley that ends up here, including stuff from western Pennsylvania where fracking is going full speed. So the fact that we've already had a very serious ozone alert this week on May 31st, I don't know if you noticed how smoggy everything was on that day, but uh, that's a very early, usually we don't get ozone alerts like that until much later into the season. Um, and so it would be interesting to know already if we are getting our air quality is already being degraded just from the activity that's already happening. Um, of course, many more wells are planned for Pennsylvania. Um, and what happens if we add 77,000 wells here to our air? We know from uh, Utah and Wyoming that in the places where we have lots of fracking, uh, ozone levels now are higher or as high as downtown Los Angeles. And that was astonishing to all of us, even me who studied air pollution for a long time, because that part of the part of the world is not really populated. We're talking about populations of 7,000 people in a huge area. There's no tra there's no vehicle traffic. There's no other industry. So the fact that you could take absolutely pristine air and and uh, degrade it to the point where it's as bad as some of the uh, urban air in our dirtiest cities over a short period of time right after fracking was really astonishing to everyone. So if we bring this technology and this form of energy extraction here to upstate New York, we don't have pristine air already. We already have trouble um, because, and we're much more densely populated. So I, I fear for a bit, kind of a big public health catastrophe just from uh, the air pollution absent the, the water pollution issues. So stay tuned about the air pollution because a lot of us are trying to kind of get some good data on that. Yes, um, I apologize because uh, we uh, arrived late and maybe this has been discussed. Go ahead. But I'm wondering if you discussed at all alternatives to hydrofracking earlier. I did not, and I'm glad you asked me that. Because there is an alternative which requires no use of water at all. So there is no need for finding a source or trucking huge amounts of water or dealing with the aftermath of hauling away contaminated water. My question is, uh, has that been discussed? Because it's certainly an alternative. Are you talking about propane-based? Yes. Yeah. No, I didn't talk about that. Um, we certainly can. Um, so in Canada, there's uh, um, an experiment to uh, frack using propane rather than um, water. So I want to make clear that all of the um, companies that hold the leases in upstate New York, it, it, they, they practice hydrofracking, not propane fracking. So none of us can legally say, well, we don't want that kind. We want this other kind of uh, technology. Um, so my understanding is that uh, from talking to Tony and Graffia and some of the other geologists that propane fracking contains um, its own risks. First of all, it's highly flammable and, and prone to detonation. So in, there have been a couple of accidents in Canada already um, with propane, which were unfortunate. Um, and also the kind of uh, using a hydrocarbon to get other hydrocarbons out of the ground, of course, make it, makes it far less efficient. Um, so we can certainly continue to look at propane uh, as uh, what you're going to put under tremendous pressure to blast 
methane out of the ground, um, but it carries with it um, more explosive risks, even though it would, you're right, it doesn't um, involve large volumes of water. It doesn't use any water at all. That's not true. So well, say it doesn't use any water. let me so. say that the question was also raised at the Cornell Forum on Fracking, in which I was part of a debate with uh, Chesapeake Energy and the members of the gas industry, and they were asked questions from the audience, good questions, just like you're asking now, to the gas industry. Um, who, who, who said that they will not be doing that kind of fracking here. So, we, I, I mean, I would encourage you to ask more questions of them. Um, if you're asking me, what I would say is that the alternative to fracking is to pursue uh, instead uh, investments in wind and solar because... The best science shows us that um, we could entirely run our energy system and our transportation system on renewables in 30 years um, without resorting to nuclear. This is an article published by a Stanford team in Scientific American last year. Um, if we agreed to, uh, to collectively reduce our energy use, our consumption, by half. So that's the big question. Um, are we able and willing to do that? Now, Europe and Japan already uses half of the energy per capita that we do. So clearly, there are models in the world for us to get there. Um, but are we willing to do the kind of investment that would take us um, to, to put us on that path? Um, right now, the biggest disincentive to wind is natural gas, because the price is so low um, that we're not investing in natural gas. So. In my mind, even if propane turned out to be an absolutely benign way to get the natural gas to rise up out of the ground and didn't kind of create the problems that hydrofracking creates, the, point, the larger point is still that it's a non-renewable resource, as is God's not putting any more of it in the ground. And sooner or later, 15 years, 40 years, 100 years, it's going to be gone. And our, uh, our children, our grandchildren are going to have to make that transition to renewables. I don't want to visit my kids with that burden. I'm the adult. I'm their parents. Uh, I'm willing to say we're the generation that should, should move us as quickly as we can to, to renewables. Um, let it start now. Let it be with, with us, not to kind of keep kicking the can on the road. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, uh, the guest of honor, our keynote, Dr. Sandra Steingraber. Please give her a hand. And there's a book signing right now, right out in the lobby, and she'll be available to sign her books. And please uh, buy one of those books and read it. It's, it's incredible. You'll enjoy it. Give it to your children. Give it to, give it to everyone you can. Please. I'll sign the books. I'll close with my last signature line, which is that we're really all musicians in a great human orchestra. It's time now to play the Save the World Symphony. You don't have to play a solo, but you do have to know what instrument you play, you play and hold, and play it as well as you can, and, and find your place in the score. So thanks. OK, uh, directly after uh, the book signing out in the lobby, we're going to get started with the health effects of hydrofracking. So uh, thank you very much, and please uh, stay. Thank you.